Hello viewers, and with today's video, I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, a quote famously said by Jeremy Clarkson, you cannot be a true petrol head until you've owned an Alfa Romeo. So here we are today with the Alfa Romeo Vito Quadrifoglio Verde. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. So a little bit of background first on the Alfa Romeo Vito Quadrifoglio. So the Alfa Romeo Vito was introduced for Alfa Romeo's 2008 model year as Alfa Romeo's smallest, um, its smallest B-segment hatchback. Um, it was only offered in three doors and you were available with a variety of engines. Uh, first launching with the 1.3 and 1.6 diesels, the 1.4 the non-turbo which was available in two different power guises and it was also and the 1.04 turbo jet which offered 155 horsepower a little bit later on the Alfa Romeo Vita Global Leaf was offered with the 1.4 multi-air engine as seen in the Abarth 124 and later on in some of the cooking varieties of the higher the higher power cooking varieties of the Giulietta as well as well as a variety of other Fiat products in 2014, the car was mildly facelifted, uh, mainly on the interior with the, and with the addition of the new connect screen and a couple of other ergonomic uh, touches, the, uh, including the offer of a dual clutch automatic on the multi-air engines, uh, which, which was available on the Cloverleaf, which was later renamed the Quadrifoglio Verde. In 2007, uh, 2016, sorry, the car was again facelifted to coincide with the launch of the Julia. The, the Quadrifoglio Verde was renamed to the Veloce, once again only available as a dual clutch automatic. And there was some revised, uh, there was a revised front bumper and a revised rear bumper as well, and a couple of little aesthetic changes on top of that. Now. The reason I bring up the Vito today is a lot of people say, though it is bad as an Alfa Romeo, this is not a true Alfa Romeo as it shares its platform with the Fiat Punto and I believe the Opel Corsa D as well. Now, and this is why I'm here today to drive this to find out if that is true. So, let's get to it. So, first off, driving at the Alfa Romeo Vito Quadrifoglio. Uh, I went into this with, admittedly, low expectations. I've heard nothing but bad things about Vito's beforehand. And I must say, I am actually very pleasantly surprised. Now, the the engine response, the, the 1.4 multi-air engine in this is absolutely superb. The pickup on it is fantastic. Um, like, you put your foot down and it just goes. Like, there's plenty of torque. Um, and as I said, these are 170 horsepower standard. Now, I believe this one has been mapped. Uh, however, there hasn't been a, um, it hasn't been diagnosed. I believe it was one of those mobile maps. So the power output is unknown. Um, now, it has got the Alfa, as I mentioned, it has got Alfa Romeo's dual clutch automatic transmission known as TCT. Now, the shifts on it are quite quick. Um, when it does <laughs> change gear, um, it is a little bit slow to react one, um, if you're pressing it on the paddles and can be a little on the jerky side. Now, um, I will say Volkswagen's dual clutch transmission as a package is a better transmission. However, this is, this is perfectly serviceable. I hear a lot of criticisms aimed at this transmission and while I, I, I confess it is not brilliant i do think some of those quote uh, some of those criticisms are a little bit exaggerated steering wise on the car the, the steering is very light um as you can come to expect with it being electrically assisted uh so feel is a bit of the car's weak point you can't really feel a lot through the road however the actual the actual responsiveness of the rack itself and the hand and characteristics of the car, I personally think, are very good for a, for a car of this size. Um, for example, uh, like you can hold this, this. This has got plenty of grip. Um, it does have a tendency um, 
to unpredictably lift off oversteer as from what I found. However, if you learn the limits of the car, as you do with any other car, it's perfectly fine. The, um, these are made up to understeer quite severely. Um, now, I have taken this for some spirited driving and I have yet to find any sort of what you'd call catastrophic understeer. Um, no more than what you'd expect from your normal front wheel drive hot hatchback. Now, the selling point of the Alfa Romeo Vito is it was one of the first, uh, the, what the Quadrifoglio Verde slash Co believe, was one of the first uh, little hatchbacks like this offered with adaptive suspension with Alfa's DNA system. So you've got dynamic, normal, all weather. Normal is equivalent to your comfort mode. Dynamic is equivalent to your sport mode where it sharpens up the throttle response and weights up the steering. And all weather is for adverse weather conditions. So it backs up the throttle and hikes up the traction control. Now the downside with that is you cannot turn the traction control off, which would be which is, would be annoying to many people, me myself included. I don't really particularly like electric nannies interfering with driving. However, if I just pop it into dynamic you can really feel that the steering does weight up and the car does have a lot more well not a lot more go but the throttle response is a lot sharper that's what we put down for this section for you And really, this car really does go for a car of this size. Now, one of the reasons the Mito never really caught on, despite being uh, Alfa Romeo's best selling model before uh, for a few years, uh, for its quite long production run of 10 years from 2008 to 2018, I believe the main reason it was killed in 2018 was due to the fact that the, the car it was based on, the, the Fiat Punto, was axed due to the fact, uh, well, one of the contributing factors was it was the first ever car on the Euro NCAP to score zero stars. That's more to do with the fact that Euro NCAP's ratings um, now account for autonomous uh, features, lane assist, things like that. Despite the fact that the Fiat, uh, the Fiat Punto, I should say, uh, did score five stars when it first launched in 2005. However, as you can imagine, the game has moved on since then. Uh, so while at that while um, the, while this wasn't what you'd call a particularly successful car in some other eyes, it was still Alfa Romeo's best-selling car of the era, uh, selling just over half a million units, I believe. Now, one of the main reasons it didn't catch on compared to its rivals such as the Mini, the Audi A1, and the like is the fact that it was when it was new, it was priced quite steep for what you got. Uh, I believe this compared to a Cooper S of the same vintage with the same sort of power, you're looking at an extra thousand pounds on top. The other thing is, as well, is the interior on this car is a little bit of a mixed bag. You have got some, you've got some lovely touches like the, me, uh, the metal effect on the DNA switch, and you've got some lovely stitching all around, and the dials on this car really are fantastic. And you do have a lot of cheap materials like for example the dashboard is just here um, and you have this horrible carbon fiber effect and you can hear it it suffers from the typical below par interior plastics of you know your standard alphas your fiat's and the like now in terms of reliability that old thought in alfa romeo side uh, i have been informed that this car actually has been pretty much fault free. You do have, um, uh, it has suffered a couple of what, you know, what I would deem as wear and tear items. So like you know, it's had wheel bearings, um, a battery, yeah, suspension bushes, things like that, and a drop link, you know. Stuff that you'd consider wear and tear on most automobiles. Now I know the, the reliability reports on these seem to be um, very much uh, Jekyll and Hyde. One's fault free, the other it's been nothing but problems. But from what I, from what my experience, if you do your research on what to look out for uh, going into these cars, if you know what to look for, you're fine. 
So for example, the multi-air units on these have got quite a short cam belt, uh, cam belt service interval. You're looking at around 50 to 60,000 miles all five years. Uh, the electric power steering um, is known to fail. Uh, so it's, that's worth watching out for. Uh, the bat box outer skins love to rot through. Uh, though having said that, um, rust issues were another, another one of Alpha's particular, uh, let's just say features, shall we? Uh, they are known for not being the most rust-proof cars. Um, the meter does score quite highly in that, that guys. It is, I believe it is galvanized underneath. Um, other than the first couple of years, you don't really hear a lot of rust problems with these cars. Uh, now, the big problem you do have, uh, the big thing watching out for on Mitos is going with the particular engines. So, the 1.6 JDTM diesel, for instance, um, if, if you look after it, chances are it will be fine. However, the 1.3 JDTM diesel, uh, from all accounts I've heard, you must, uh, it is not worth the effort. They suffer from, you, you, they suffer from turbo issues, DPF problems, timing chain problems, and the list does just go on. Uh, they did offer this with their Fiat's award-winning twin-air two-cylinder turbo, which I have heard is a fantastic engine, um, as well as the multi-air and the turbojet units. Turbojet units are generally very reliable, though the multi-air units, again, um, generally solid engines, though you do have to watch out for changing the multi-air filter every now and then and keeping an eye on that multi-air actuator as on the early cars, so like 2009 to 2010, uh, and going into 2011s, they are known to fail, and the part for them is £800 before you've even had it fitted, because I believe they do have to be coded to the car. So, while multi-air unit, among multi-air actuators on later cars are rare, it is known to happen, so it's just something worth bearing in mind. Now, the big question I have is, does this feel like Alfa Romeo? Now, the answer to that question in my eyes is yes. Yes, it does. Ignore the fact that it has it has Fiat-based parts, a Fiat-based platform. It does. It has that it has that sort of special quality about it that you can only seem to find that I found in Alfa Romeo's. Uh, as I've, I've, I've driven a few, I've driven, for example, yeah, I've driven 147, Julietta, Julia, uh, 156, and 159, and a Brera. Um, and I do hope to drive more of them in the future as I do have a bit of a soft spot for old Romeos, I won't lie. Now at first, I was a bit of a critic of this car thinking, oh, it is just, a, as the title implies, a fancy punter. However, I am willing to take that back. It does genuinely feel like an Alfa Romeo. It has that special quality about it. It has that sort of effect on you that no other car manages to achieve for me it does just feel like an Alfa Romeo yes like other Alfa Romeos it does have its fault it is not perfect and in a lot of senses they are hard to recommend though what I would recommend that you do is just drive one and you'll see there is far more to it than paper suggests Okay, now taking an outside view of the Alfa Romeo Mito Quadrifoglio Verde. It is a very, very handsome looking car, uh, in my personal opinion. And you do have a few nice little flare, styling flares over the standard Mito, just to denote this. So as we come around to the front, you can see you've got these sort of elliptical headlights. Now, the trim on these was available in different colors. You could have chrome, you could have, you could have the gray like those featured on here and others. Uh, now, the grill on this was the same, but uh, the grill, according to the owner, used to match the headlights where it had the little grey slats going across, but however, he's changed it to a honeycomb grill with the Alpha Surfer behind there, which I do think is a very nice addition. As we come round to the side, so these are the Sportiva versions for future for these 18-inch sundial, I believe they're called. Uh, diamond cut alloy wheels and I really do think they really do set the car apart they look fantastic 
Uh, you have got Rembo 4 pop calipers behind there as well, which that's one thing I did forget to comment on. The braking power on this car is fantastic for a car of this size. As you come down the side, you can see it is a very compact car. You have got the Cloverleaf badge just there, which really does denote this car. Now, this car is sitting on a set of coilovers. The standard cars do ride a lot higher than this. As we come round to the back, so it does have a it does have a smaller resonator on the back, giving it a quite a nice verbal sound, I, I must say. So, uh, and you do have these lovely this this back end is what makes it for me. Which fun fact: these rear lights are shared with the same lights that you would get on the Alfa Romeo. For staying into the interior now, so this car has this really nice sort of two-tone cloth where you've got the light and dark grey here with the green and white stitching giving it the you know the quadrifolio verde colours and what I really like is you've got half the Alfa Romeo logo there and half of it over there. Now the seats in this they were offered with Sable carbon fibre bucket seats they do look fantastic but they are extremely rare and extremely expensive to get hold of. You do also have these lovely steering wheel here as well uh, which I believe is pinched from the Giulietta and then you have this carbon fibre effect on the dashboard which is the part that I was mentioning it is a little bit on the cheap side and you can see you have got a lot of this Fiat plastic in here as well uh, you do have the DNA mode switch is just there as well as the dual clutch TCT system as you can see and for 2014 they were facelifted and with and the Uconnect screen was added in. Now, uh, there were a few options on it. So for example, this one has DAB and satellite navigation selected, which I believe were um, DAB is a fairly hard option to come by, uh, but most, uh, but all of them did come with Bluetooth connectivity as standard. And as you come over to the dashboard just here, you can see You've got the little clover leaf in there and i really do think it stands out really nicely with the little italian touches like benzina for fuel uh aqua for your air temperature and things like that and coming over once again you can see you've got a lot of this cheap fit plastic and the, st the typical fiat sticky buttons so like i mentioned before the interior on this car is a bit of a mixed bag so this brings us to the final question would one buy one? Now, the answer to that question is, it's hard to say really. Uh, if it was the Quadrifolio version, yes, yes I would. Uh, the cooking versions, I've driven the just the standard tune on Multi-Air, and yes, uh, yes, once again, there. Um, and I've yet to drive a Twin Air, however I would like to. Uh, as I said, you'd, uh, for me personally, I'd avoid the 1.3 diesel just due to the uh, sheer amount of issues that it is known to have now and while the car is not perfect it does have its problems it has got an endearing quality about it and you can pick these up um let's start with the 1.4 non-turbos for a little under a thousand pounds so the answer is despite uh, despite its, its flaws yes i would buy one of these and I, i'd urge you to have a look for yourself as well thank you once again for watching and the answer to the question is this is more than just a pretty figure. So, once again, thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video. Bye for now.